Hi everybody, I'm Professor Paul Lee. Today I'm going to talk to you about cartilage regeneration. Thank you very much for coming this lunchtime 108 Harley Street snippet. Uh, so first of all, a little bit about myself. I am an orthopedic surgeon, but I also have extensive knowledge on sports medicine and regenerative medicine. My doctorate is on uh, re regenerative medicine, so I do know one or two things about cell therapy and how we can apply that clinically. Uh, the good thing is that I get I can use a technique within the sports medicine as well as orthopedic surgical uh, sport medicine technique as well when it comes to cartilage regeneration. We are a recognized center for the International Cartilage Regeneration Society Teaching Center of Excellence in terms of cartilage therapy. And also we are recognized by the International Society of Cell and Gene Therapy as well. So today my talk is talk is around cartilage regeneration. What is the possibility and how we can actually regenerate cartilage? And what other different type of treatment currently is available? And what is possible and what is friction? All right, so first of all, I want to clear something out. This talk is not about stem cells. And if anybody want to talk about stem cells, I suggest them have a look at this uh, very, very interesting program or uh, from BBC. Uh, it's about the stem cell, heart cell, which targeting clinics that try to push stem cell. To summarize, basically, currently there are no stem cell therapy for cartilage regeneration. If there's any, because it is banned by the um, MHRA as well as the um, uh, FDA as well. So if you want to learn more about stem cell, why we shouldn't call things stem cells, please listen to this program from the BBC. But today, let's focus back on uh, cartilage regeneration. Why are we want to talk about cartilage regeneration? First of all, we want to, of course, we want to prevent arthritis. We want to treat arthritis. We want to offer our patient a more biological solution. We want to delay the inevitable sometimes with the metal work of total knee replacement. On these photos here is one of the intraoperative picture of a arthritic knee. I highlighted the area that where the arthritis is. As you can see that uh, there's bone rubbing against bones, what we call bone on bone arthritis, um, and some other part of the patella as well that was uh, rubbing against this, this um, trochlear groove here and caused arthritis. And you can see osteophyte coming around the knee. Now in this specific knee that there are some good cartilage still lying around, but most of the joints are diseased and it lead to it lead to different problem. And today we're not talking about knee replacement. We will do another talk at some point about knee replacement. But today we want to focus on trying to help people to avoid to have knee replacements. All right, so here are some myth buster. It's a few things that you may hear about or maybe, you know, read in a textbook or learn from medical school, uh, all those sort of um, all these sort of myths. So the first myth I want to debunk is that people say that cartilage does not heal because it does not have a blood supply. Now, that is definitely not true. I can tell you that for a fact, all cartilage lesion heals if you give them the correct environment. They do not need blood supply because cartilage chondrocytes do not need oxygen. They, are, they live in a anaerobic environment, so this is why they do not need blood for them to heal. We can go a little bit deeper in a minute and looking at the cartilage architecture. All right, so next, next myth is that microfracture. You might or might not have heard of microfracture. You probably would have heard of microfracture because it's been around for a very long time. And they say this is the gold standard of treatment for any cartilage lesion. But I would say absolutely not. I think it is something that can be done because people just be able to drill a hole into the bone doesn't mean that you should do it. Microfracture does not make sense. Microfracture alone will lead to hemarthrosis. It does not lead to cartilage regeneration. I can do a separate lecture on that completely, but if you think about it, you're drilling a hole in the bone, what would happen? It will bleed. If you have blood bleeding into a joint, what would happen? The joint will fill up with blood. It will lead to hemarthrosis, not cartilage regeneration. Next thing, stem cells are the way forward to treat cartilage lesion. I think we have talked about that earlier on in terms of stem cells and how we use cell therapy. Certainly right now, this moment in 2021, stem cell therapy for cartilage is not something that we should really be thinking about 
if we really want to call these cells or different therapy that we give people stem cells, we need to think twice. We should not lie to our patient. Taking bone marrow out and spin it down is not stem cell. It just concentrated bone marrow. Bone marrow contain bone cell, does not contain cartilage cell. But this is it again, end of the topic. But right now, this moment, stem cell are not the way forward, at least not with the current technology right now. The only stem cells that's available is basically from embryonic stem cell, which is currently illegal. Um, the next thing is there is no evidence of any cartilage sheet treatment. So there are um, so no, there's no study and people, all, all these uh, cartilage treatment are witchcraft. And again, that's absolutely not true. There is no evidence if you don't look at it, of course, and if there, there is plenty of evidence out there and even NICE have recommended cartilage treatment. So let's go into cartilage rege regeneration. It's all down to a principle of how we can rebalance our body, rebalance our cells. This is a di this is a diagram that I often show when we talk about regeneration and cell therapy. We need to make sure that we have the four factors into balance, which is we, we need to make sure we got cells. If there's no cells, nothing will grow. If the cells is, is dead, there's no point. Growth factors, we want to make sure we stimulate those cells into the right area, develop in the right way. We want to make sure they have a good soil, which is where the scaffold for the cells to go to. And finally, we must guide those cells correctly, make sure our biomechanics is correct or our mechanics is correct. This is very simple. It's just like us planting a plant into the soil. Make sure that we got good seed, good nutrient, good soil and a stick to guide them to grow. It's as simple as that. Of course, we, nowadays we want to make sure the nutrition um, um, environment is also good and rehabilitation is also good. So as, as promised earlier on, I'm going to talk to you briefly about what cartilage look like and what is the architecture within the cartilage. You can see this slide here. It shows that the articular cartilage surface is at the top, which is a nice smooth layer. This is basically all collagen fiber. And then when you go to the deeper zone, you can see the chondrocyte staying within these, um, these uh, cell, the matrix within the collagen. And then after that, the very important thing, the tie mark here, which is a, a very, very definitive structure to separate the bone, uh, which is highly vascularized, to the cartilage, which is non-vascularized at all. So you can see that there's no blood supply to the cartilage because these cells do not need blood, do not need oxygen uh, to survive. They get their nutrient from the synovial fluid and they, they tend to uh, use anaerobic respiration. And we can talk about that uh, in, in a different lecture as when we're doing lab, lab work, we actually start growing chondrocyte in a, um, a, a, in a oxygen less environment in compared to how we traditionally do it in an oxygen rich environment, which actually we have much better result. The cells are growing much better because that's where they supposed to be. All right, so you can see there's no blood supply to within this cartilage layer anyway, so they do not need oxygen. You can see the tie mark there is there to, to stop the bone get into the cells, uh, into the cartilage here. So by microfracturing it, we're just breaking this tie mark to allowing these bone to get there, which doesn't make any logical sense. Now we talk about evidence of uh, cartilage surgery and you know what is the outcome and is it really witchcraft? I do not think that is a witchcraft because I think that cartilage surgery do work so when we, if we, we are selecting the right patient with the right mechanics with, a, with the right treatment. Because even NICE, which is very, very stringent criteria to approve things, and even NICE and recommended using autologous chondrocyte implantation for cartilage treatment. Also, in some very high caliber journals, such as the American Journal of Sport Medicine, have shown there is a very long term 20 years outcome of ACI and the patient do very well. And also there are long term study and long term outcome for cartilage uh, treatment and cartilage regeneration. Given that a lot of these evidence, a lot of these study are not UK based, for some reason for the last 20 years uh, in the UK, the cartilage regeneration tend to be a small pause. Uh, a small void within within the within our British literature. Uh, when I work with Professor James Richardson, who is the uh, champion of uh, cell therapy on cartilage therapy, have tried to do some papers and try to do some study, but there are not that many uh, British paper out there. Most of our evidence are coming from uh, America and Europe, uh, as I think there's that down to a lot of 
a lot of um, reason due to fundings and due to the landscape of how um, the ACI was looked at by NICE before this uh, latest update had been published. So now let's talk about what treatment is available right here, because otherwise, you, you know, I, I can go all day and talk about the different, uh, different ACI or Macy and things like that. But actually, what is important, what is available right now that can actually treat people with cartilage lesion? So first of all, we want to think about non-invasive non substances. So for example, um, physiotherapy, electrical therapy, um, uh, magnetic resonance therapy, these are relatively new and some of them are not, I don't think there's enough evidence out there yet, but what I'm going to show you now is what is available that uh, there is evidence behind it. And in terms of injection wise, we can we can think about platelet rich plasma. There is um, gold and rich platelet rich plasma to actually enhance those cytokines. So we can call it the awful kind and also high uh, We can inject biological scaffold into the knee as well or any joint. There is cartilage filler and also there's joint filler as well. And of course, there's lipogen, which is fat cells therapy. All these have their own evidence, have their own right, but these are very useful substances for patients that would want to have minimally invasive or non-invasive um, percutaneous type surgery or in, even injection, I shouldn't use the word surgery. Um, so these can be done with ultrasound guidance to place into the joint. And the key is choosing which substance to use when. Uh, if you choose the right substance in the right patient, patient can do very, very well. But the key is to knowing which patient to give what. For example, if someone got a bone on bone grade four osteoarthritis on both sides of the knee, most of these substances would not work. Um, but at the same time, if you got somebody got a slightly grade, grade two lesion that got local focal pain, chondral filler worked very, very well. Um, again, if someone got generalized arthritis, maybe the awful kind of injection could really help. Uh, so there are many different type of injections there. Uh, PRP is very common. We use it a lot and it is, uh, we have very good results from it. But I think the key on that is picking the right patient. So after we talk about injection, I want to talk about the other stuff, the mechanics. So remember my, my diagram of the four things that we need to look at. So if somebody uh, have a malalignment, so if we look at on this left leg on here, you can see where the, the green line is here. We're drawing a line from the uh, hip, uh, center of the hip to the center of the ankle. You can see the weight bearing axis, it goes straight down and it's bisecting the medial side of the knee. It doesn't matter what we're gonna do on the medial side of the knee, it doesn't matter what magic or what cells or how expensive um, of the cartilage graft that we put in there, it's never going to work because the body weight going to keep on trashing it and keep on pushing all the weight onto it. Um, so without, so what we do on those occasion is we want to change those anatomy. We want to correct the alignment, and then now the weight bearing axis is now the knee is straight. So now from this point onward, we can start thinking about replacing the cartilage, replacing the meniscus, and doing something to regenerate that regenerate that joint. Without doing that first whatever we do in that joint is doomed to failure. And the other thing I want to quickly briefly mention before we go down to the actual cartilage stuff is the meniscus. There are many patients that have meniscectomy when they're young. It could lead to big problem. You can see this is a arthroscopic picture of the um, of, a, of a meniscus that has been debrided and, and been cut out uh, five years ago and the patient start developing arthritis. You can see that the bone here is not so happy. The bone here is not so happy. So in these patients, we can replace their meniscus with this synthetic material. And, th and there we got very good result and got good histology to show that it, have, it, it can actually scar up and become part of the body. And, the, and after patient that undergo a high tibia osteotomy to correct their alignment, the next step for us is to re regenerate and replace the meniscus. And after that, only after that, we should start looking at the actual cartilage surgery. So in terms of the cartilage surgery, I want to quickly show you a few pictures. This is a normal, healthy cartilage. That's what they look like arthroscopically. arthroscopically. So, you know, very, very shiny, very, very smooth. Then you can jump to grade two uh, of arthritis. There's grade one in between, but grade one is very difficult to show you on the photo because it's more like when I'm probing it, it just look a bit soft. Grade two, you can start seeing some degeneration. Grade three, you can see more degeneration that clear, clearing onto bone. And grade four is just down to bare bone. 
So these are the four different uh, stages of our flight test arthroscopy that we can see. We can see the difference between a nice smooth surface to a very rough bony surface. The challenge is to get this bony surface back to that sort of level. And of course, with, as I talk about without the alignment, without the meniscus, we cannot do that. So these are some of the cases I want to share with you. It's one of the cases we did recently down in Harley Street about uh, fixing this um, this uh, lesion here. So there was a patient that with a that's the knee, that's the medial condyle. There's the it's quite a large. This is the depth of the defect. It's one centimeter, and then that was before the debridement. It looked like that. After debridement, that's what this looked like. And then when we we treated it with scaffold, and then we have put cells on top over it. Again, this is another case. We use a slightly different technique with a uh, allo well, with a uh, allograft, and then put a membrane over it to protect it. Uh, and then we can do these surgery arthroscopically as well for keyhole. This lesion is smaller, so the lesion was like that a uh, bit, bit of bone. We freshen it up. We put a super clot scaffold on there uh, to allow it to dry. Uh, it's a bit technically demanding because we had to do it uh, through the water uh, for arthroscopy, and then we turn the water off. We put gas in then we can uh, allow these to dry for it to set before we uh, come out. Uh, but you know, it, for smaller lesion, it's very useful. Um, another case I want to show you, this is a uh, knee again, which is on the patella. Uh, so this is the kneecap at the top there. You can see this is the femur. You can see there's a defect right in the middle, and that's our arthroscopic picture. You can see in the middle there, there is a, that's the defect, which is what this is look like. So after we debride it, again, we put the, um, the, the super the, the super uh, biological scaffold on there uh, to regenerate to give them the uh, the cartilage some substance for it to regenerate. Uh, these are some of our results. So this is pre-op and that's post-op for the same patient. This is 12 months down the line for following the uh, single stage cartilage regeneration um, treatment. And you can see on here the, the defect was there before. Now the defect have disappeared. And we can look at the cartilage going on here, which is this gray stuff here, and it's going all the way around. So it does work. We can regenerate cartilage as long as all, we respect the environment and understand the pathology behind it. So this is my final slide, which is the keys for the cartilage regeneration. It's about timing, about the technical know-how, about the knowledge within when to do it, when not to do it, what technology is available, what, what is actually possible, understand the overall picture about the patient. Are they in a correct alignment? Is there any dynamic issue? What tools is available there for us to do? And more importantly, it's about the rehabilitation and about the nutrient, the nutrition, uh, how to create an environment for these cells to survive. So we are, and again, we are not talking about stem cells. Uh, so this is the end of my talk, and I hope that you enjoy um, my talk. And if you get any questions, please um, email me. And, uh, and if you've got any patient that you, you think that would benefit for cartilage regeneration, uh, please send them to us and we can look into them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.